Foreign object is back. I've returned from a Mexico vacation. A little tanner, a lot more relaxed, and officially qualified to talk about tequila. And I now have a certificate from Poncho's restaurant in Cairo San Lucas to prove it. So where was I? This is episode 21 of Foreign Object, and I'm your host, CJ Werleman. Today I'll be talking with someone who said no to tequila, not because he didn't find it delicious, but because his religion demanded him so. Not just ordinary religion, but extreme Islamism. In fact, my next guest is a former jihadi and author of the book, Undercover Jihadi, Inside the Toronto 18, Al-Qaeda-inspired homegrown terrorism in the West. Mubin Sheikh's story is absolutely riveting. It really is spy thriller stuff. After being arrested by Canadian authorities on the charge of providing support to terrorist groups, he was, in turn, recruited by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. As an undercover jihadi, his brief was to infiltrate a terrorist cell called the Toronto 18, a group that plotted to storm the Canadian Parliament, behead the Prime Minister, and explode truck bombs all around Toronto. His book gives a fascinating insight into how terrorist groups recruit, train, plan, and execute. And Mubin is here with me now. Mubin, welcome to Foreign Object, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me. Mate, welcome. Welcome. Mate, uh, let, I guess to give my listeners, um, but I guess before we delve into your backstory, I want to give my listeners a sense of how your life has come full circle. Now, when I first heard that the planes had struck uh, the Twin Towers on the morning of 9-11, the first two words to leave my lips were, holy shit. Now, the first two words to leave yours, however, were a little different. What were they? Ah, uh, they were, Allahu Akbar. Oh, you, you, you terrorist bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you really, when, when you heard the news, ex- explain to me what happened when you heard the news. Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I mean, okay, so I was working for a customer service uh, company. It was managing student loans, okay, the real terrorists, I tell you. Um, and it was, <laughs> a, it was a, you know, behind the phone, you don't know what I look like. You don't know if I'm, uh, I mean, I'm born and raised Canadian. Uh, by the time uh, of the 9-11 attacks, I had been uh, very religious, overtly religious, uh, full-length beard, robes, pants above the ankles, you know, anti-Western sentiment, of course, probably because I had this crappy customer service job, I don't know. Um, but the the idea was, it starts in 1995, and we'll get to that, but yep. that day that I drove to work was any other day, the radio was on, I'm feeding, I'm consuming myself with news all the time, fixating on foreign policy, Muslim affairs, and I hear a plane goes into a building. So my automatic reaction is to declare, proclaim, you know, Allahu Akbar, God is the greatest. I mean, we didn't even know what had happened. Mm. It was just a plane hitting a building. It could have been an accident. Mm. Uh, But the problem was is that to get into the building that I worked at, you had to drive up a driveway, which then forced me to see the office building in front of me. And then become seized with the idea that what if a plane flew into this building right now? Mm. So as I went, uh, you know, uh, to the main area in the lobby, uh, I said to somebody, I said, hey, did you hear a plane hit a building? A second person came forward and said, hey, did you hear that a plane just hit a building? I said, well, look, I already said that. And he said, no, a second plane. And that's when I also thought, oh, shit. Uh, uh, Please, God, don't let it be Muslims. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, I was very wrong about that, and um, that would that would begin. That would be the first serious cognitive wedge that would force me to reconsider my commitment to the cause. Okay, so that was the f- first blow to your radicalized faith. You believe at that stage? Yes. Okay, interesting. Now, and we'll, we'll come to that. But you know, so you, you know, you're born and raised in Canada. So, what was life, you know, for a, a young Mubin in Canada? Yeah, actually, you know, the uh, I'm I'm from uh, have Indian par- background parents, um, and uh, I was uh, look. I think I lived a comfortable life. Uh, I know I lived a comfortable life. My father was, you know, uh, middle class, just slightly upper middle class. Um, I grew up in the UK himself, uh, so was you know somewhat liberalized, but still conservative. I mean, uh, socially anyway, uh-huh. uh, coming from India and all. Um, by day, I went to public school. By evening, I was in a rigid Quran school. Uh, so already what's happening is a parallel world is created for me. By day, it's multicultural open experiences. By evening, it's closed, rigid fundamentalism. You know, the Indo-Pak, uh, Indo-Pakistani background teachers would, would beat you. 
uh, if you wrote, if you read the Quran incorrectly. So you can see the the idea of religion as a violent experience is is inculcated from youth in this regard. Uh, I grew up. I was uh, went to high school. I, I joined the army cadets at the same time. Uh, the army cadets gave me another peer group, another value system. It introduced me to militancy, if I can say that, but uh, regulated through the state spectrum. And, and I th and I think back in hindsight, this is one of the reasons why I defaulted back to a, a relatively pro-state approach is because even when violence is discussed, it's always discussed in the context of rules of engagement, uh, conduct of ethics. Of course, you know, uh, people don't don't uh, you know achieve those objectives fully. Uh, we can go into, of course, the mistakes that governments make, especially national uh, national security agencies. But all in all, mm. uh, that was a part of my experience. And finally, high school, uh, I I fit right in. I didn't. I wasn't discriminated against. I wasn't bullied. Uh, you know, I I got along with the guys. I I got along with the girls. Uh, it was a pretty good good life, but. What happened was um, I had a house party uh, when I was 17. Um, my parents were out of the country. Uh-oh. Unbeknownst to me, my father had told my uncle to check on the house. One night, really rocking crazy party, <laughs> my uncle walks in. Oh, man. And, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> We've all had that experience. It was, it was, it was horrible for me. Uh, long story short, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, basically, I was made to feel very guilty about what I had done, you know, that I had defiled my home, people pray in this home, what kind of person are you, this is not, you know, what we're about. So I felt very, very bad. I thought to myself, wow, how can I possibly ever make this up, um, you know, to the family? So I thought, okay, you know what, I'm going to get religious, quote unquote. And getting religious, and this was the whole idea, and you see this in a lot of the stories of young people who go down this road. They've come from a, you know, they've made mistakes in their life, and uh, they, they're, they're made to feel so bad and so guilty about what they've done is that they go into this rebound radicalization. It goes from being, you know, a gangster-like, you know, you know, always ready to scrap and fight, rough-minded, um, you know, uh, uh, inclined to committing violence, and then suddenly... You want this quick fix, and a lot of people do this. It's not just the religion of Islam, but in prison you get a lot of born-again Christians. Uh, this whole idea that by going further into the religion, harder into the religion, that will somehow correct the screw-up that you are uh, as you perceive it. Right. Yep. Uh, so this is what happened to me. I, I spent four months in India and Pakistan. Um, while I was in Pakistan, I had a, a bona fide... Uh, an, chance encounter with the Taliban um, and it was at that moment that I was quote unquote bit by the jihadi bug okay so what, why did you decide to leave the you so you left the Canadian cadets to go to Pakistan uh, okay good chronological stop here the I was a cadet from the ages of 13 to 18 uh -huh. okay and, uh, and then you have to leave because you're too old it's it's the idea is really to prep you to either join the, the reserves or the regular forces. Yeah. For me, that didn't happen because of this party experience and this identity crisis that I developed uh, after that happened. Because with the family and the community, you know, uh, blaming you, making you feel bad, you, you, you know, this need to belong to, to your, uh, your cultural community as a very strong driver in human psychology. Well, I just want to talk about that before we move on to Pakistan. That was something I want to talk about, that, uh, that whole identity crisis. And I, and I guess I, I, I want to, that was again a question I would ordinarily ask a stripper or a porn star, but, and I wanted you to tell me about your relationship more with your dad because a group of psychologists recently undertook an evaluation of a number of ISIS detainees inside uh, one of Lebanon's notorious prisons. And they found uh, the following, and I'll quote, Almost all of the people, ISIS members, we interviewed had some type of absent father syndrome and that they were all either extensively humiliated and abused or abandoned by their fathers at a young age. Now, that clearly you wasn't the case for you, but tell me more about that dynamic between you and your dad. He was obviously very conservative. You felt, did you uh, a close bond with him or did you believe the religion had pulled you and him apart? That's a that's an excellent uh, observation. Um... 
Uh, very good. Actually, nobody's really brought this up in, in other interviews. Uh, let me make a general point on uh, just basic psychology, nature versus nurture. Uh, you have two-parent home. You know, you are going to learn from your parents, their behavior you will imitate. Uh, in broken home scenarios where you might have two parents, but they're dysfunctional, you might have only one parent. It could be a mother or a father. Uh, it does matter whether it's a mother or a father, especially if the child is a boy or a girl, will develop, you know, will force certain kinds of dysfunctional behaviors uh, flowing from that. For me, both my parents were stable. Um, I did have a, uh, uh, you know, I, I argued a lot with my father as a teenager, and I would say it was a typical teenager rebellion. It was, you know, what time I could go out until... Uh, you know, he didn't, you know, it wasn't like, you can't go watch the movies, you can't go this and that. Uh, he knew I talked to girls, he knew I went to the movies, he knew I would go out late. Uh, uh -huh. You know, so so there was some tension, but it was very normal, I would think. It wasn't really, there was no real um, uh, abuse or, or significant humiliation that, uh, because you're right, uh, I did see in some of the individuals that I investigated as an undercover operative, uh, this missing father syndrome. In fact, the Toronto 18 case, uh, all the top guys who were uh, convicted all had absent father or dysfunctional father relationships, every single one of them. Wow. Um, right? Where, for example, you have one, Sharif Abdul Halim, um, you know, guy made over $200,000 a year, uh, drove a convertible baby blue BMW, uh, but had real, real father issues, meaning his father made him feel bad that he wasn't a religious kid he wasn't a good kid and it was more severe for him so for me I had a little bits of it and in fact I would make the claim that because of my functional um, home environment that's what prevented me from going the other the other way right. that was a, that was a safeguarding uh, factor for me did maybe and that's might, might have been a factor in bringing you back so to speak Yes, uh, I mean, uh, I could always, I mean, now, my, my, I mean, we have a great relationship, my father and I, but before it was the typical teenager one, you know, your, your parents, they hate you, and they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, screw up your life because they don't care, and what would they know, and, you know, so, uh, similar, similar things, but um, so no, when, you're, well, you're right about the, the absent father scenarios, it features very prominently. Mate, I find all this stuff so fascinating. I mean, you know, terrorism is something that which has, you know, been the forefront of it, all of our minds since 9-11. And I just, there's so, there's, there's so much crappy analysis out there, particularly which is driven into cable TV news. And there's very few, you know, really few bits of hard data and people are doing exhaustive and really robust studies into what, you know, causes radicalization. So I, f I found that fascinating. And that's, you know... Uh, further enlightening that the fact that you found that consistent with your experience in, you know, in penetrating the Toronto 18. Now, coming back to then Pakistan, was your dad supportive of your move to Pakistan? Well, the the group that I eventually went with is a, it's an apolitical group. In fact, it's it's different from any of the other groups um, out there. I mean, it's uh, most of the groups that we deal with and interact with at this level are all politically um, driven groups. Uh, this particular group is a very closed, internal, missionary-type group that goes to other Muslims and reminds them that the more you practice the religion, the more that God will bring about desired change in your world. And so with this creed, I had gone to India and Pakistan, and it was very good. But in Pakistan, uh, as I was going around the local area preaching this creed, I came upon these guys who I didn't know who they were. I was not yet politically turned in or tuned in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said to them, you know, I gave to them this, uh, this, this creed. And they said to me, and they were armed to the teeth, first of all. Uh, they had beards. They, they dressed just like I did. But, I mean, they were armed to the teeth. And they said to me, look, if you want to bring about change in your world, you do it with this. And he held aloft his AK-47. And I thought, wow, you know, what a powerful statement, you know, and I uh, was just taking it all in. And when I came back to Canada in the fall of 1995, this same group came to power in Afghanistan. Um, and so I took that as a validation of their creed that, well, here I am preaching about the change and here they are doing the change. But that they weren't, the, the guys you met in Pakistan weren't the Taliban per se or what would tell Oh, no, they, they, were, they were the Taliban. Oh, they were. They were the, the original real Taliban because the Kuwaita is where I was sent 
right. in Pakistan is it was the stronghold, in fact, was where the Taliban Shura, uh, you know, continues to operate, I think, but for a long time uh, was, was their central location. Okay. And so it, what I can gather uh, uh, is, a, so you're radicalized in your, and this is where people make, uh, you know, people get confused. There's radicalization of your faith and then there's radicalization with violent extremism. And, you know, there's, there's still no provable link between um, Salafi uh, interpretation of Islam and violent extremism. I mean, one doesn't automatically lead to the other. Um, and what appears from, in your case, is you were radicalized in your faith, but you became more radicalized from a political sense once you left Pakistan, India, and you came back uh, to Canada. And I'll, and I'll quote what you'd said in an interview. You said, uh, this is after you returned from Pakistan, these ideas were swirling in my head and I started to move away from the apolitical and become political. And this is where I started to get involved with the conflicts that were happening in the world. The Chechen conflict had happened, and I think there was one initial Gulf War. So this is in 1995, all the way to September 11 attacks. And during that period, I just became more and more extreme. It became for me that the West is the enemy because that's who you're fighting. Um, the, West had, the West has gone and taken over Muslim lands and installed puppet governments in those lands, and I supported any jihadi group that was fighting the oppressor. Uh, that's... That's how you saw it. So you now you've gone from an apolitical religious belief to now a very political, radicalized belief. Yes. Um, so if you can imagine, radicalization is the is the process, right, whereby yeah. a person uh, comes to take on violent views, and that is marked by a number of things. And really, what you what you what we look or we try to look for is where certain aggravating factors coalesce. And this is which what will push a person into the next stage, if you will. So, for example, for me, it's, it starts with uh, early in my life where there is this uh, created dichotomy between cultural identity, public school by day, Quran school by night. And this is laying the foundation through my years of development until it uh, that trigger moment of the, the party um, forces that uh, identity crisis to the fore. Um, and so that's that's part of the process. Then, of course, there is the turn to religion, uh, and, and in this case, a political religion mm -hmm. uh, as an aggravating factor. And then a, a third point of this meeting with the Taliban, uh, the idea of uh, identity of the Muslim as a as a fighter, as a jihadi, um, and it continues. And so, so like you said, it moves from you know identity to looking to religion for answers, to looking for a political version of religion for the answers, and so on. Right. Well, you, so the, the way you say that, that uh, Islamic jihadists become uh, radicalized by their world experience, and then they turn to the Quran to justify their vengeance? So this, yes, this is uh, one of the arguments that are made in the whole uh, deprivation argument that people look around their situation and see that there's something wrong. So whether you want to get academic and look at Mughaddam, um, Mughaddam uh, is a Fath Ali, Fath Ali Mughaddam wrote uh, the staircase theory on uh, terrorism. Then you have um, uh, scholars like um, uh, John, let's say, uh, sorry, I can't remember his name right now, but he's yeah. talking about it's not right it's not fair, it's your fault, you're evil. And this is the process by which people look at the situation around them, look to see who's responsible for this, and then assign blame to them, and then assign, you know, then dehumanize them and then kill them. That's right. the full spectrum. So, um, so, so the, the idea of uh, grievances, of being deprived, looking at the socio-political culture in which they're growing up, in which they're developing and they're seeing, they're looking around them, and yes, they're going to turn to whatever sacred value that particular culture refers to, whether it's religious scripture, whether it's um, a, a discourse that is drawn from religious scripture, let's say, in the case of, you know, secular Western uh, Judeo-Christian understandings, which, I mean, aren't really derived from scriptures, but, you know, they these are people influenced by that culture. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, 
Okay. Religion is just one thing among others that people look at. But if I could just make this point, the reason why religion is such an aggravating factor uh, is because of what religious teachings give a person. So the idea of transcendence, the idea that your sacrifices, your commitments, they transcend this world. You know, it goes into a, another life. Huh. Uh, so this is a powerful driver um, in, in that regard. Also, uh, the idea of receiving sanction for your behaviors, so violent behaviors. Uh, we sanction violent behavior through, let's say, in the Western context, responsibility to protect, okay, as a political doctrine in which we can go into other countries militarily because they're not treating their own people right. So we can go in and, uh, you know, ex exert force on them. Yeah. So the idea of sanctioning violence, uh, these are things that religion offer this, this mix, and and with your experience, I guess, with the Toronto 18, and your 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 you know your deep insight into uh, into the jihadi mindset, out of all the radicalization models out there, and there's there's literally loads. I think the FBI still works with. This, I think it's the five step uh, theory. Um, what what radicalization model uh, do you think best fits the reality? Well, I mean, you you, you won't really get one size fits all. Um, I think the basic one, I mean, because there are other models, of course, Mark Sageman has talked about, uh, similar to what you said, where it's, it's peer groupings and people that you know, rather than what you believe, mm -hmm. right, that, that get people involved. And in fact, he's shown, uh, he's a former CIA guy, he's, he's shown, and in fact, religion comes after the fact. It's moral grievances, uh, that, that, uh, begin the process. So really, you have to look at, A, what is the... Uh, the environment in which this person has grown up because if they come from a war zone deprived oppressed humiliated that's what's going to start them off uh, to get radicalized uh, or as opposed to somebody let's say who's living in the west who does not come from a background of war oppression occupation etc but looks upon another uh, you know a people who are in another place and, and, and goes through a period of vicarious deprivation. So here I am, Muslim kid in the West, middle class family, but I'm watching videos all day long, every day of suffering, humiliation, occupation. I then begin to feel I am humiliated, I am deprived, and thus I must act. That, that's that vicarious deprivation. Um, what did you say? Vicar vicarious Deprivation. Deprivation. That was. Uh, I mean, that's that's a beautiful term to even describe that um, that Muslim, the the eighteen year old from Melbourne, uh, who just detonated right. himself as a suicide bomber for ISIS uh, in Syria. And if you read his martyrdom uh, letter, he goes through all of this. You know, I, I started watching the news. I started seeing you know uh, U.S. drone strikes killing wedding parties in Yemen and Pakistan and the slaughter that was happening in Afghanistan and Iraq and how many civilians the U.S. Uh, drove out of Iraq, killed, bombed, etc. And he started to identify vicariously through their suffering, even though he comes from a well-to-do uh, neighborhood, suburb, family in, uh, in Western culture. Yeah, yeah this, is, uh, this is consistent with what, when, I mean, if you, anyone who sees the effects of war, it is impossible for you not to feel some kind of some emotion, whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, uh, whether it's a desire for revenge. And this is consistent with even what, you know, the ex-head of MI5, uh, she once gave testimony how the war in Iraq radicalized the whole generation of people, of British Muslims, in fact, was her, was her statement. Uh, a lot of these people, they saw these videos, they weren't ideologically inclined, but when they saw the imagery, they saw the, the consequences of that, uh, of that invasion in 2003, uh, of course they would they would turn to how do you make sense of this? What what do you, how do you explain this? And so this is where of course a lot of people went down that similar path. Okay, and so when you uh, after 9/11 you went to Syria, <clears throat> is that right? That's right, and yep. uh, it was a few months after. Uh, so by about um, uh, March, I had made my way. And 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 that's where you did your Islamic Arabic. Uh, studies. That's right. So after the attacks of 9/11, of course, um, you know the whole day was a very, very uh, troubling day. I mean, I had people were calling my house. Uh, my wife even joked, you know, like, "Are you sure you don't have anything to do with this?" Mm -hmm. 
I mean, uh, <laughs> I, had... you, you tell a, t- a really touching story uh, on that day, nine eleven, at work, and um, and it just when 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 I heard you say this interview, it just you know it, it really touched on my how oh, my whole outlook rather than demonizing uh, Muslims, which a lot of my atheist colleagues do. Um, that's going to be that's not going to solve the problem where we you know they believe in this mythical clash of civilizations uh, narrative, but. You tell a story that, you know, 9-11 happens, all your work colleagues are looking at the TV screens, your supervisor comes up to you, and when you tell the story, I'm expecting him to say to you, uh, were you involved in this? But instead, he says to you, look, if anybody says anything mean or bullies you, you, you come to me and let me know. Um, you couldn't have been anything but moved by that. Well, and, and you know, this is... I mean, this is why that day was so important for me because it uh, was not only the the whole idea of flying a plane into a building and to people who, like, they have nothing to do with our fight. Uh, and, and two, going upstairs because first was the awkward elevator ride up to the floor. And I can tell you, I mean, people were staring me up and down. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the bosses then came up to me and they said, look, uh, if anyone says anything, you tell us. And I was, I was struck that, wow, like, this whole this event is ha- happening. There are people who are colleagues of mine who have left their desk because they're they're frantically phoning their relatives in New York to make sure they're okay. And like I'm the only bearded guy in that place. All right. Okay. So it's like, and uh, that was another point. That holy crap! Like I mean, this all this is going down, and they're worried about me. Right. And, but, and it's, but but yet you you went to Syria with the purpose of becoming radicalized even more. Well, you know, I what happened was I, I resolved that the the world will never be the same. Um, you know, Islamic prophecies talk about, uh, you know, a, a great battle that will take place. Um, you know, some event is going to flip the switch, so to speak. And, and that was that was 9-11, obviously. And thereafter, a great battle would take place in Iraq and Syria, in the precincts of Iraq and Syria. And I thought to myself, let me go to Syria first. Uh, so I can be there when when the Great War kicks off. Now I was actually ten years too early, unfortunately, or <laughs> unfortunately I don't know which it is. Sure. Uh, but uh, I, I went there with the idea that look, the world is forever changed. Uh, it's just going to get worse from here. It's going to kick off and become this confrontation between, or uh, apparently between, the Christian world and the Muslim world. And uh, that's why I went to Syria. But uh, while I was there, of course, I began to study Arabic and Islamic studies. Um, and there were other things that happened to me there that made me rethink again, you know, my worldview. For example, I the Syrian schools would not hire me to teach English because of my overt Muslim look. And which was shocking to me. I thought, what the hell? I'm supposed to be in this Islamic utopia. <laughs> and uh, Well, that probably is now. <laughs> yeah, well, Northern, North, North, uh, Eastern, right? Uh, Syria. <laughs> Yeah. And it was the American school that hired me to teach English yeah. because, like they said, we don't discriminate. You're a Westerner. Come on in. So after studying the religion, after, you know, that kind of positive experience, uh, the scholar taught me, you know, we went through the verses, showed me the context, the meaning, how to interpret, you know, rules of interpretation. Um, and that's what really de-radicalized me. It got me away from these ideas of... Of, of violently explaining every single verse at every opportunity. So on Islamic interpretation, how are the terrorists interpreting Islam wrong? The jihadis, Salafis. Yeah, well, a uh, perfect example is chapter 9. Mm-hmm. Uh, chapter 9 uh, has some of the, the verses, the, all the verses of the sword, as they call it. You know, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. Uh, statements like that. Mm-hmm. And... What I mean, it, it's so easy to to explain away because, like the scholar said to me, he says, you know, you quoted to me verse five, okay, chapter nine, verse five. Uh, he goes, do you normally start reading from chapter five, <laughs> right, or from <laughs> verse five? You know, doesn't it make sense to read from chapter one? So I said, yeah, that you know makes sense. <laughs> you go to chapter one, and it tells you very clearly who the, that chapter is talking about. It's talking about the polytheistic tribes that had broken the peace treaty with the Muslims. Exactly. Right? And then yeah. if you keep going, verse 4, verse 12, 
it says, except those with whom you have a treaty, who have not treated you badly, who have not fought you. We're basically, we're not talking about those people. Hmm. So, so, you know, that was just one very quick example of, and another one was, you see, I use the word unbelievers. So, you know, uh, and, and in Arabic, I had said to him, you know, kufar. So he said, look, the verse here is not, the, the word in this verse is not kufar. It's mushrikeen. Mushrikeen means polytheists, which is very separate from ahl kitab people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians. Mm. So to use that verse and to say that it means you can kill Jews and Christians is, is, is wrong on so many levels, at least two levels. I mean, we can say just on the, um, you know, people who are fighting you versus polytheists. Mm. And I, I always make this point that uh, when, when uh, Muhammad is saying kill the unbelievers, he's also, you have to put that in context of uh, he was constantly under attack from, you know, the tribes in, from the polytheists in Mecca. And you have to read these as, you know, he was under, you know, under strength military trying to put together a military to defend the city of Medina from these attacks. And of course, they're going to be sound like, you know, Mel Gibson and Braveheart, a call to war to, you know, juice up his men for battle. You know, had a specific meaning in a specific period of time for these specific battles. That's, I mean, again, you see, this is because you're an intelligent guy, right? Like, <laughs> you, you know how to do what's called situational attribution, right? When you yeah. look at what's happening to, to see the context, to see everything that's happening, and this is why, I mean, I got out of my extremist interpretations. For example, like you said about Medina, you had 10 years in Mecca where they were being slaughtered, tortured, um, no verses to fight. I mean, just talking about oneness of God, you know, prophets of old, uh, help the orphans, the poor, all that good stuff. And then in Medina, when they came to attack, the first verses are revealed regarding jihad. And look at how, and it, and it lays the foundation. It, first of all, it says, permission is given to fight mm. because the because normally it, you were not supposed to fight that was the whole point permission is given to fight those who evict you from your homes you know basically rob your stuff and then sell it on the on the market you know you you can do something about it that's the whole point and uh, i mean you know people have you know they they take things so simply out of context like for example if you look at the american listen to the american national anthem I mean, I could say that's like a jihadi nasheed, <laughs> okay? Bombs going off in the air and the home of the brave. And because this is a part of our national history. You know, war traditions, the glorification of war fighters. This is something that is consistent across cultures. So the idea of jihad, of the mujahideen, fighters who are fighting for the right reasons, the glorified war fighters... This is just, it's consistent across all nations. I mean, there are contexts to it. We, we uphold the document of, uh, you know, Western constitutions. I mean, I'm um, Canadian, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I mean, I, we, I love that document. It, it draws, I think, a lot from Islamic principles, Islamic values. Uh, and, you know, th this is the point that, you know, we don't, we, we, we kind of absolve our own past of treating uh, Aboriginal people as slaves and animals. I am Australian. Uh, we don't talk about that. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> like in Canada, it's the same problem. In America, what was done to First Nations. Um, so, but yet, look, I mean, some good came out of it, right? I mean, we don't dismiss all of it. We recognize that that is the context in which people were operating. Now we've introduced this human rights doctrine post-World War II. Uh, we're struggling to fit into that, but some nations, I mean, realistically have achieved, uh, you know, far more than other nations. And uh, again, it does come down to, to education, really. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, indeed. and so, so you're, de you're, start you're starting a process in your mind, at least, that you're becoming de-radicalized in Syria uh, because you're finding these, you know, Islamic scriptures aren't consistent with what these jihadis or Salafis or Takfiris are saying. So you come back to... Uh, you come back to Canada and you're, uh, you're arrested. No, I, I wanted to correct this, actually. Oh. A friend of mine was arrested. Ah. A, a friend of mine from that Koran school that I, I referenced early on in my childhood, he sat right next to me. He, him and I were buddies when we were kids. We would play together. Uh, you know, he has other siblings. Um, and 
he had been, Momin Kawaja had been arrested on terrorism charges in connection to the London fertilizer bomb plot. Mm -hmm. And uh, that prompted me to contact the Canadian Security Intelligence Service really to give a character reference for the family to say that, and I said this to them, I said, wait a second, this must be a mistake. This, I mean, like the family is a good family. Uh, you know, I didn't want, you know, the rest of the family to come under suspicion or scrutiny. But of course, uh, like many cases we hear about, you don't know what people do in secret after hours in their closed circle of friends and whatever. And uh, basically the intelligence agency, they, they recruited me. They said to me, look, you know, uh, the, I explained to them my whole story, my journey. They said, look, we, we like the way you think, all right? We want you to tell us who you consider to be a threat to national security, why or why not. And I saw my job as uh, a verifier, right? Because even in the Islamic system, um, you know, the, it, it, the Quran talks about, look, when news comes to you, then verify it, right? Lest you harm somebody inadvertently. So uh, I was, I was uh, confirming or denying information that had come to the service about XYZ people. So yes, some pe people were threats. Uh, I considered them to be threats and I reported them accordingly. Others, they were not threats. They were perfectly fine or they might have been engaged in, let's say, certain uh, political Islam uh, activities. But you know what? I mean, we might not agree with it. We might not like it, but it's not really a threat to the national security of the country, you know, to the point where you need to designate resources, human resources and follow people around. So, you know, it was it was a little of both. And, and I did that for about two years. Um, and at the end of the two years, uh, another group that I was sent in to find out about made known their intention to commit criminal offenses and. Uh, now the investigation moves out of the intelligence service into the federal police service, and that's the Toronto 18 because it became a public prosecution. That's how you know my identity became known, my activities, the activities of what national security agencies do, uh, all became known. So, how, so how did you infiltrate the Toronto 18? Which is, you know, I know it's going to be a long story, but how, as quickly as you could, how could you, uh, how would you des describe the process that you infiltrated the group? Right. I mean, I, I can keep it short. It's basically, yep. um, you know, it starts with a presentation that's taking place at a banquet hall. Uh, I go there, I sit down. Uh, what are the chances that one of the targets, as they're called, comes in and sits right next to me? <laughs> You're uh, kidding. And then says, hey, I'm waiting for the rest of my buddies to show up. And I'm thinking, this is perfect. <laughs> and the rest of his buddies show up. And then, you know, they come to the table. We, I, I stand up as well. And join them at the other table and just kind of, you know, said to one guy, I'm like, hey, haven't I, didn't I see you at such and such mosque? And I was just, I mean, BSing him, but it turned out he did see me at that mosque. And I thought, wait a second, I, I think I do know this guy. Uh, uh, so at the end of the presentation, the group goes outside. Uh, there's a little bit of chit chat. I open the door to my militancy by saying, you know, while well, some of my friends are in prison. Um, you know, and a number of things happen. One is an ideological pitch that's given to me. So again, um, they, they quote unquote recruited me by highlighting the crimes committed by the U.S. in Iraq. Mm. Uh, that was the first thing they went to. They said they're raping women, they're killing women and children. Um, and don't you believe we got to do something about it? That's the follow up. God, that, that's all, they're almost identical to what the uh, London yeah. uh, fertilizer bomb guy said. Uh, and they said, this had nothing to do with religion. We, would, we watched videos of uh, the atrocities in Iraq, and we knew we had to do something. Let's do something. Almost identical. It is, it is the common narrative. This is why when I reference Mark Sageman, you know, he's written two books, Leaderless Jihad. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the whole point is that moral grievances start a person off. Because that's what, you're, that that's what gets your emotion. Mm. There's anything that's going to make you get up and do something. It's going to be emotion, whether anger, grief, you know, something along those lines. Uh, Boston bomber, his trial is going underway. You know, he literally wrote in blood on the inside of the boat. You know, this is because of your crimes in Iraq. Uh, so it's not a justification. It, that's this is an explanation. Okay, there, there's a difference between the two. People sometimes, you know, confuse that. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, we don't, you know, they don't let people identify that as a driver. 
because they they seem that uh, you're trying to justify it. So it's not a justification. Sure. So, anyways, um, the this is the whole idea that uh, uh, moral grievances. Uh, look at what they're doing in Iraq, and then number two, ideology. So the uh, his question to me was, you know, is jihad uh, something that is an individual obligation or is it a communal obligation? And and this is an old debate in uh, in Islam. Um, you know, the whole point is this: is that if there's a Muslim land being attacked, uh, the people who are there have an individual obligation to repel the attack. It's self-defense. Huh. Um, and then, if the people there cannot uh, defend, repel the attack, then the ob- obligation falls on the Muslims nearby. And so it kind of goes out in a in a you know ring fashion. Right, so if internally in Syria it can't be done, well then regional players got to step up and do it, and then it goes outward, right? So the jihadis, these guys, uh, I mean, I don't even like to call them jihadis because they're not doing jihad, but of uh, you know these violent extremists, yeah. they, 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 they say that no matter where you are, you have an individual obligation to go and fight, and that's why 16, 18, 21 year olds are going to fight because they're they're they've convinced themselves they have an obligation to fight. Um, but Islamically, that is actually not the case. The case is that you leave it to people who are there. And and this is, you know, especially now with talk of ISIS, etc. This is why the conference has come full circle back to regional countries uh, needing to, to, to do something about it uh, rather than turning this into a Western, you know, crusader alliance, which is, you know, the argument that, that's being used. Mm. Now, with the Toronto 18, were they all Canadians? Um. They were all Canadians, yes. Um, some born and raised, some uh, coming from an early age. Uh, so I remember we're talking about the whole dysfunctional family, dysfunctional father roles. Uh, Fahim Ahmed, Zakaria Amara, the two main leaders. Uh, Fahim, you know, was uh, came to Canada in 1994. Uh, this is, you know, uh, just before the Taliban took over in 95. Uh, this is the, the fighting between the Mujahideen that took place after the Soviets uh, withdrew in 89. Uh, so basically from 89 to 94, you had this this conflict which creates displacement. So his family grew up in a refugee resettlement center in Pakistan, um, you know, came to Canada. The parents were always working and relatively practicing, like really not, not very practicing. I mean, the father didn't have a beard. The mother wasn't in a burqa. You know, she, she covered her hair, but you know, it was a it was a liberal covering of the hair, which is like you can still see some of it. It's not even like a real hijab, so to speak, which covers all the hair. Uh, mm-hmm. So relatively practicing uh, father, Zakaria Amara, uh, his father was uh, again relatively practicing. The mother was a was a Coptic Christian. Mm. Well, uh, well that, that that brings me to my next question of the eighteen. I mean, you know. How many of these guys are actually well versed in Islamic scripture? Because you read this all the time, particularly Western recruits. That you know, Islam for dummies is the number one book. They know nothing of their faith. Again, this is uh, also uh, you know drawn out by Mark Sageman that it's a very superficial understanding of the religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the Islamic scriptures talk about this: individuals who will emerge, uh, you know, foolish youth. Uh, the Quran will not pass their throats, meaning it's very superficial. Uh, they have a very, very uh, shallow understanding of the religion. And, and it is defined by cherry-picking verses in particular. Mm. You know, they, they will always re- refer to these verses. Look, the Quran says you can do this. Uh, because the problem is, is that they've already come to a place uh, emotionally, intellectually, where they, they want to do this. They figure they have to do this. Now, where can I go and find a justification for it? Mm. And, you know, I'll quote part of a verse you know, to, to justify. And that's exactly what they do. If you, if you ever, if you ever encounter them, read the, you know, the passage before it and the passage after it, and you'll, you'll get the context and you'll see very quickly that, uh, this is a cherry picking of the verse. I always find it extraordinary that, uh, both these, uh, literalist violent extremists and Western, you know, staunch Western critics of Islam interpret, cherry pick, the, and take literally the, the verses and and read them in the same way. I, I think that's just an extraordinary symbiotic relationship. It's it's irony. I mean, to the nth degree. Uh, I've 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 said this. You know that uh, some of these people they they've come on. They just they hate Islam. They they figure Islam is to blame. This is fundamental attribution error. 
um, you know, when when uh, you know Muslims are doing something, you you blame their Islam for it and not and ignore the socio political context in which all this behavior is taking place. So my joke is that you guys would make great ISIS recruiters. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean that's exactly right. I mean you, you know uh, you've got uh, you know these critics like on Fox News or right wing or or these new atheist critics, and I'll say you know we're at war with Islam, and ISIS says, see, you know they said we're at war with Islam. There's you know to become each other's best recruiting uh, tool. Um, you know so on that the your your um, so what was your take then on the Graham Wood Atlantic piece? ISIS. How wrong was that, or did you believe it was close to the mark? Well, I mean, uh, again, this comes back to how much people want to blame Islam as it is. Mm -hmm. So, even in reading the sources that are that are made available online, there is a level of confirmation bias. I think that exists. You know, I already believe that Islam is an evil religion, and it's to blame. So, I am going to naturally gravitate towards those articles which confirm my position. Yeah. So, so the Graham Wood article did that for a lot of people. It, it, it you know, was, um, it was useful in that regard. Uh, number two, it, it was not factually correct in the sense that uh, they are Islamic, because I was a part of uh, a response to that carried in the New Statesman, uh, which said, "Well, that's actually that's not the case, right?" Uh, Mark Sajun is quoted in it. I'm quoted. Uh, others are quoted. Uh, which, well, wait a second. I mean, this is my argument. If the if the actual caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr, um, said, "Don't kill women, don't kill children," when you come upon people who are in monasteries, leave them alone. When that is the instruction that's given to the soldiers, and then this group comes out and does the exact opposite of that, how then could you make the claim that what they're doing is Islamic? When in fact the the rule is very clear: you can't do that. So when people do that, and they might they might let's say miss, you know quote this verse, chapter nine, verse five, if you know to make an easy example, hmm. you can't say it's Islamic because it's going against what Islam is saying. So the argument I think that you know the m people want to make, and this is something I'll I'll, I'll acquiesce to if that's the right word, uh -huh. is they're not pulling these interpretations out of thin air. Okay, they are referring to the Islamic sources. Uh, they are definitely going to the Islamic scriptures, but this is the counterpoint that yes, they're going to them, but they're completely, I mean, butchering the interpret interpretation of the verses, the applicability of the rulings, um, the, the current context in which we operate. So, for example, the idea of taking slaves. Okay, you know, for uh, the idea of taking slaves was something that was held, I mean, even in the Western nations until actually very recently. Uh, whether you want to go into the U.S., <laughs> so it, it's not that far off. I mean, yeah. like, even with the abolishment of slavery, we still treated people like 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 garbage. Well, we uh, still we still have institutionalized racism in this yes, country too. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Canada has a whole history with residential schools, sexual abuse, really ethnic cleansing of people. I think so. So uh, we're moving away from that. That's the whole point. That's the value that we are encouraging um, people follow. But this is why, you know, even, and to be honest, in some Muslim countries to this day, the idea of indentured servants or, or even slaves, whether it's, you know, Asian slaves in the Middle East building, you know, build big buildings, we've moved away from that, generally speaking. I mean, maybe it's less than a bit. We still have, you know, child labor and, uh, uh, in, in uh, developing countries. But the point is, the Muslim world generally moved away from that. You don't see Muslim countries taking slaves. I mean, this is the only group that's come out and done that. So it, it's trying to revive a value system from a bygone era, you see. Right. And, uh, it, works, it works for them because, um, especially with ISIS, you know, this is all ex-Saddam government trying to reclaim power, and they're just using the cloak of religion to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, you know, the former... Former Baathists, former Saddamists, Saddam, who are using uh, extreme elements, you know, the, the Sakawi era to uh, to get back Sunni power in Iraq. And people can't see that this is clearly a civil war, and that Sunni tribes are using these ISIS as basically their military to uh, to get back uh, power. It's uh, is baffling. But you know, on West Western critics of that, and this is what I want to segue to was, um, I mean, you you appear on CNN uh, regularly uh, as a commentator. Um, 
this whole terrorism expert industry, uh, which is driven by a lot of Western intellectuals, many of, many of whom haven't even travelled to the Middle East. Uh, Glenn Greenwood says to be considered a terrorism expert as far as cable TV network goes. All one needs to do is ignore facts, trumpet US propaganda and blame Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> How accurate do you think uh, Glenn is on that statement? Oh, yeah, I think that's pretty spot on, in fact. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, I know I, I'm very mindful of the fact that I don't want you to tread on any toes, but I mean, we, we're talking now that the homeland security industrial complex in this country is $60 billion per year. That's how much the annual budget and a lot of its funding is going to a lot of people with dubious backgrounds, uh, unqualified backgrounds. Uh, one of my colleagues from Middle East Eye, um, Nafiz Ahmed, who was also also contributed to the 9-11 Commission report. He wrote a great piece on, um, on uh, uh, these uh, unqualified experts posing themselves as uh, terrorism experts, and he specifically was referring to Majid Nawaz, uh, the Quilliam uh, director. Uh, what's, what's your take on Nawaz? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, yep. uh, you know, I've... You know, for me, interviews are easy because I spent um, I spent years in court under you know sworn testimony. So um, it, it's look, Majid Nawaz is a pioneer in in regards to uh, he was one of those Western guys very involved involved with Hezbo Tahrir. Um, you know, he was a, a group that's quite active in Australia, um, and he was arrested by the Egyptians, tortured for a while, uh, had the chance to revisit his views. Um, you know, was in prison with high-level, you know, Egyptian uh, terrorists who were also serving time. So he has had a very, very unique uh, experience in that regard. And a lot of his um, uh, his material in regards to the, uh, the the ideological root of these violent extremists is is really on point. I mean, he's right about groups that have a very fascistic, rigid, hard interpretation of the religion. And um, these are the same people that beat their wives, okay? The same ones that will commit violent extremism or are more likely to, to engage in domestic violence, engage in other kinds of violence. It's, it's, it's what flows from that kind of mentality. The, the criticism against him, which, which I also share, is that in terms of he's kind of gone too far the other way in the sense that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a robust... Uh, defense of Western policy in Muslim lands. Now, I have a, a cautious acceptance of Western policy. Some of it is very good. Some of it, I mean, the West does a lot of good stuff in the Muslim world. Uh, but the problem is, is you can't expect, uh, you know, places to replicate a Western system overnight, uh, especially where they've grown up in military dictatorships. So this whole idea of the Arab Spring, and, and we, you know, we expected decades of institutional military dictatorship uh, to just be done away with and there be this perfect transition, you know, over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so uh, this, I think, is where a lot of his message doesn't resonate with, um, with, with Muslim-minded individuals who, look, they, they want to draw from their sacred values. I mean, it's impossible to to argue against that, right? People, yeah, uh, sure. they, they want to take from different systems, not, you know, there is no one size fits all. Um, and so, so he's, I mean, he knows, he knows his stuff in terms of ideology, this and that, but yep. I think he's, he's trying to make uh, relevance uh, uh, in policy uh, in terms of how, how to deal with this. Well, my, my criticism then goes a little bit further as I find those guys who push that very pro-Western foreign policy are the ones who uh, I see them as opportunists because that's where the money is going to naturally flow uh, because that's the guy the media wants to hear. If you sell that kind of narrative, the former jihadi who is now pushing a pro-Western policy narrative, well, you're going to get a lot of time on television um, because cable TV in America, corporate-owned media, isn't geared up to have, have people questioning what America is doing in foreign lands. That's why, you know, guys like Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges and Glenn Greenwood, well, Glenn Greenwood to a lesser extent, but certainly the first two don't get played a lot. And these two guys are probably the foremost experts and intellectuals on Western foreign policy in the Middle East. So um, there's, there's an opportunistic nature there of, uh, of the, this that I'm always, always very wary of. Um, 
Um, so where, where do we go from here as far as the war on terror? Um, and you know, we're, we're, we're almost at the end of time, but what, what is the West doing wrong in as far as executing the war on terror and what must it do to rectify uh, going forward or to fix it going forward? Okay. Uh, <laughs> ter terrorism is, of course, a, uh, it's a problem of politics. Okay. Yeah. So the root of this is political disenfranchisement whether it's the participation of uh, religious groups in uh, the political system. Because, I mean, this is, this is what we saw happen in Egypt. I mean, it, it was a coup. It was, by all definitions, a coup. Um, you know, the, there was a poisoning of the well regarding the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood had rejected violence for, you know, decades. Uh, other groups, you know, left them because they participated in the political process. And the whole argument was put down your arms, participate in the political process, and you will, you will come to power, but that power has to come with you know, popular support. And the end result of this is that these groups will moderate. They will moderate because at the end of the day, everyone wants power, right? And if they could have been allowed to lose in elections fair and square, then you know what? A grievance narrative would not have been constructed. But what I saw come from that was a lot of extremist groups then say, you see, this is why we don't engage in the political system. This is why we choose the bullet box, not the ballot box. Ah, good point. And, and so uh, they were right. They were right in that sense. So, well, so what, I, sorry, just to interrupt you on that, and that, this is a very good point you're touching on because uh, this is what the Western media does. Is they, they, they pretend that something, someone like the Muslim Brotherhood is created in a vacuum and just came out overnight and becomes violent automatically, but they never show what the Muslim Brotherhood was a response to. And it was a response to the fact that when, you know, the British left Egypt, then, you know, these secular militaristic, you know, regimes were put in, which, you know, uh, paid, you know, these British bankers back all the money for the Suez Canal, and all this money went funneled to the West and to the corrupt dictators and autocrats in power and starved the people of, you know, infrastructure and welfare and that. And so the Muslim Brotherhood becomes a populist movement peaceful populist movement to stand up for the people who are being impoverished uh, and then it transcends into something else when political debate becomes impossible in a country where you have you know an oppressive you know autocratic regime so anyway that I just want to add that because people don't see what the Muslim Brotherhood started as well yeah, this is again a, you know a situational attribution looking at the context in which all these things are happening and you know especially with the Brotherhood you know, the, the idea is people are so averse to any kind of religious rule, and, and I can see why, of course, that they we renege on our own principles of, of you know, the claim commitment to democracy, popular, you know, parliamentary representation. Um, this, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm a Sufi Muslim. I have no ideological links to the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, so, I mean, my my support of them in this regard is is just based on, our values. We're claiming that we believe in, you know, democracy and voting and not military dictatorships because, like you said, I mean, it impoverishes the people, uh, especially in terms of education. Uh, the people are dumbed down. Um, they're they're given a boogeyman to to hate, and that boogeyman is you know uh, disseminated is, is like identified by the state. You know, so everyone's chanting death to the Jews. They're blaming America because, you know, they're kept in that state. So. You then can't blame the religion because the religion has nothing to do with it. It's a political environment in which, you know, these people's behaviors are being, uh, you know, crafted and conditioned. Uh, so, so back to the the, the larger point now. Uh, look, some kind of uh, political enfranchisement uh, is necessary. Uh, clearly, you know, you cannot kill your way out of this. I mean, this is the quote from General General um, Stanley McChrystal, who was in charge of special ops. Um, uh, David Petraeus, you cannot fight your way out of an industrial-sized insurgency. So, you know, all these gung-ho, uh, you know, types who are like, let's bomb them all, right? <laughs> listen, you know, listen to the warfighter experts who have been there and done that, okay, for 10 years. And when they come out and say, listen, that doesn't work, I'm tempted to believe them <laughs> than some armchair general thinking, yeah, you just push a button and that solves our, our problems. Uh, what needs to be done now in particular in Iraq and Syria, and I'm a big believer of uh, in uh, local Muslim countries uh, needing to step up and do something, especially about Syria. 
I mean, you have over 10 million people displaced inside and outside the country, a quarter of a million people killed, uh, and it's just getting worse and worse. And it's, I think we're in the fifth year now. I remember, uh, you know, and I was on this uh, right from the start. I watched the whole foreign fighter thing begin and all the split and ISIS coming into Syria. And uh, people thought, hey, let them kill each other off. You know, we don't like Al-Qaeda and we don't like Hezbollah and they're both fighting each other. So go ahead. No. Not realizing that this is a, a geo, uh, you know, um, in the local geopolitics, this is a fight between Sunni and Shia. So. No, they're not just going to let them kill each other off. The Sunni countries are going to step up and start moving weapons in. The Iranians are going to step up and start moving weapons in. And, you know, contrary to what you think, they're not going to, you know, go away. They're going to become bigger and stronger. And that's what's happened. Hmm. They have, you know, so many more weapons now than they did four years ago. Yeah. When some kind of something could have been done. But, you know... So even that idea of, well, just let them kill each other off, that's, well, again, that's not consistent with the reality on the ground. And it's, it's, it's just blatant ignorance. I mean, people uh, forget, too, that the pro-Iranian-backed, you know, Assad regime is also arming, you know, the Sunni uh, ISIS, you know, to fight the Free Syrian Army. I mean, it's such a triangulated, you know, messed up thing that sending American troops, and, you know, as you said, uh, hitting a button is not going to solve, uh, solve anything. But, um, mate, we're going well over time, moving. It's, uh, mate, this has been awesome, and I, and I have said this at the end of other interviews, so uh, this is going to sound corny, but this, for me, has been by far the most enlightening, enlightening of the 21 episodes that I've, uh, I've done for an object. I mean, you've just provided fascinating insight, um, you know, on, on the thinking and the mentality and, and, and how these groups and cells come together. Um, I encourage everyone to read your book, Undercover Jihadi. Where's the best place people can find your book? It's on Amazon. Okay, that's easy. And uh, mate, you're on Twitter. Your uh, your Twitter handle is is at Caliphate Cop. Cool, man. And uh, uh, my Australian listeners, uh, Mubin was on sixty minutes uh, last weekend. Mum, you're going to love this <laughs> love this episode podcast. So, uh, Mubin, thanks for having this chat, buddy. It's been awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Now, good on you, mate. I'll see you back on Twitter. Cheers. See you, mate. Bye bye. Bye.